Hey guys, welcome back to a new video. In this video, I'm going to teach you how you can make your code cleaner with sealed classes in Android. I will tell you what a sealed class is, um, how it compares to enum classes, and then specifically two ways how you can use these to make your code really clean and readable. Let's start with what is actually a sealed class. A sealed class is a kind of a language construct of Kotlin that I haven't seen in any other languages. It is basically it's basically enum classes on steroids. So that's what I call it. Some people may argue, no, it's not really on steroids. It's just a different type of enum with other strengths and some weaknesses. But I just like seal classes much more and I call seal classes enums on steroids. So if you don't know any of these two, these are basically both classes that represent um, a set of arbitrary values. So we can use these to define our own values, our own set of values. For example, like here, we have our own car class. And this car class has different types of options we can assign to such a car. So we have BMW, Audi and Mercedes. And whenever we have a place in our code where we need to distinguish between different cars, we can just use such an enum class or such a seal class to assign an instance of, of that class any of these three values. Now you can already see these, these two classes kind of look similar, but they also look a little bit different. So enum classes basically just define a set of, of fixed values. So the way this works behind the scenes is that each of these values just gets assigned a number. So BMW would be zero, Audi would be one, and Mercedes would be two. But for the sake of readability, we just see these as these names here in our code. However, with sealed classes, that's not the case. In sealed classes, we actually we actually have classes in that class or object, which are singletons in Kotlin, and those define our different options here, and they actually inherit from the parent sealed class. And that is the main difference or the main um, characteristic of sealed classes, that only the classes or the objects that we define in that seal class are allowed to inherit from that seal class or classes that are defined in the same file. So if I would have another class here, um, for, yeah, let's make it another object. For example, Lamborghini, and that would be um, inheriting from seal class. That would also work because it's in the same file. But if I would put this Lamborghini class inside of another file, it couldn't inherit from seal class because that's how a seal class works. So let's start with a little comparison between these two um, ways of defining a set of values because of course they are very similar. Let's start with the single advantage I see in enum classes compared to seal classes and that is that they are um, they are numerized out of the box and that makes them easily serializable and deserializable. So what that means is as I said, behind the scenes, each of these values is assigned to a number. So 0, 1, and 2. And if we now want to send such a car via the network, for example, to a remote server, or we get such a car from a remote server, then it's of course much easier because we can send numbers over the network, but we can't send um, such such arbitrary values here over the network. So there are only a set of basic data types like uh, integers, floats, strings, and stuff like that, that we can put into a JSON file, but we can't put such a class here, such an object into a JSON file, unless we serialize it correspondingly. So as long as we have the same enum class, client and server side, we can easily just um, pass the value of the current entry to, to our request, and on the server side, we can easily just deserialize that. So server side, we also have these values that are much more readable than just um, some kind of number. However, let's now get to the advantages of a sealed class and why I always use sealed classes. And number one is that sealed classes can actually have generic type parameters. So if we want to use a generic type parameter for enum classes, you see that doesn't work. Enum class cannot have type parameters. For seal classes, that does work. Of course, we need to pass one for these um, single single classes and objects in here as well. But that does work. I will show you in this video how this can be helpful. This would be too overwhelming right now. So just keep watching and you will find out about that. That is one advantage. But the even bigger advantage I see in seal classes is 
that sealed classes can hold instance specific data. So what the heck does that mean? Let's imagine we kind of want to extend this class and we want to assign or we want to, we want to be able to, to also pass a model to these car classes here. So of course, if you, if you look on the street, you won't just find a Mercedes, you will find a specific model of a Mercedes. And if we, if we want to have, if we want to be able to, to pass that model to make each Mercedes individual and to, to distinguish between different Mercedes, we need to pass a model. So what we can do is we can have a constructor here, val model, which is, let's say a string here. And well, now we of course need to pass that in these constructors as well. But if we do it like this, let's say for the BMW, we pass, I don't know, let's say an M5, then this would now hard code every BMW to be an M5. And that's of course not what we want. We want to be able to have different BMWs with different models. And by the way, this is also possible with enum classes. So if we have the model in here in the constructor, we can also just pass that here, like for the BMW, for example. And this would again, just hard code the model for each BMW to M5. However, what we can now do with sealed classes is we don't have to make these singletons. We can also make these data classes. And then we can assign an individual constructor for each data class. So we can again, just pass the model here. Let's make that a normal class. And then instead of passing or rather hard coding the model here, we pass the model we passed individually for that BMW. So now what we accomplished is that each BMW can have its own model. So it's not like that we just have these fixed values. We have BMW, Audi and Mercedes, no we can now have different types of BMWs. And that is what I mean with instance specific data. So these don't need to be singletons. Instead, we can also just use normal classes that have a normal body here. As you can see, you can put functions in these and that just allows a little bit more flexibility than with enum classes. I mean, here we can also have bodies and functions in here, but it, it doesn't really behave like a normal class. So that is why I always use sealed classes they are just much cleaner in my opinion. So far for the more theoretical part about the differences here, let's think about how we can make use of these CL classes to actually make our code cleaner and take a look at some practical examples. So I will, I will delete this car class again here. And you can see I have a main activity and just a very, very small example project here, which basically just displays a list of persons, which I also hard coded here, but that could theoretically be a response from an API. And then you can see this list is displayed here. So UI state items is that list of persons and each person has a name that is displayed here. Then we also have a loading status and we have an error status. So let's start with the first scenario in which I use seal classes. And that is actually to expose state in a view model. So you're already seeing that I have a UI state here that contains the whole state for our whole screen. But let's first of all, take a look in our repository to understand where this actually comes from. So here we have a repository and that has a function to get data. As I said, this just simulates getting data. It uh, delays the coroutine, so it simulates that delay. And then in one of two cases, it just throws an exception here. So we can also see how the error would be or how the error would look like. And if that random number was not zero, then it will just respond with a list of success. It uh, responds with a list of some persons here that are then um, handled in the, in the view model. And if an exception happens, it will respond with an error resource. So now you might wonder what is that resource class here? And that is a sealed class, ladies and gentlemen. So let's take a look here. That might now look very complicated. If you know my project based playlists or tutorials, then you know this class. But you can see it's a seed class resource and that has a generic type parameter T because what this now allows us is to define a success and an error case. Because we need some way to forward the, the success or the error state of our repository because we want to be able to catch exceptions in our repository here. And if no exception happened, we want to be able to pass the data to our view model. But our view model needs to know, okay, was there an issue in the repository? Was there an exception, maybe no internet or so, or was it successful? And if it, if it was successful, 
give me the data. That is what the view model really needs to know. And that is all this resource class does. So we define two options that both inherit from this resource class because it's a C class that works if we define the classes in here. The success case contains the data. So if we have a successful case, we of course want to attach the data, the list of persons in, the, in our case here. And if there is an error, then we want to attach an error message. So the view model knows what actually went wrong. And optionally, if we really want, we could also attach some kind of data, but we usually don't have data in an error case. So that is one way of using C classes, just to, of course, distinguish between different types. That is what you already learned when I um, talked about the differences here. But what I rather want to show you is, I said exposing state in a view model. So let's take a look at our main view model. Here we just access our repository. Um, we have our UI state. And how that does this UI state look like? Well, it looks like this. It's a data class that contains, if we're loading, if there's an error, and our actual data, our, our list of items. And then it contains a seal class error. So now we actually have an error class that that we can use to forward the specific error that, that happened to the actual activity, to the actual composable, so to our UI layer. So if there was a network error, we can simply emit this, this specific error. If there was, um, if the input was too short, this error, input was empty, this error, and we can just extend this as we like. The reason why we don't just attach an error message here, because that of course is something we could also do, is just attaching a string that we display in our UI, but we often want to use string resources for error messages. And if we want to use string resources, then we have to emit these errors, because we can get these in our view model unless we have the context in our view model, which we want to avoid. So that is why we rather emit such error singletons in this case, that describe the exact error that happened. And then, uh, oops, not that one. Let's do it like this. And then in our activity, as you can see down here, we, we can simply have one expression that handles these specific errors. So that's very readable now. We just see, okay, when the UI state error is network error, we display this text with this string resource. If it's input empty, it's just a different string resource and so on. So we can very cleanly handle all these different error cases. Now, one more question you might ask yourself is, why is this actually a data class and not a sealed class? Because what we could also do is, we could have a sealed class. Um, let's call it sealed UI state here. Don't call your classes like that. I just don't want a name conflict. Mm. And in here we could have, for example, a state loading, and that is a sealed UI state. Then we could have a state error. Let's make that um, a data class, for example. And that would contain the actual error, which is of type error here, which we have in our um, which we have in our UI state, the other one. Uh, this one here and then we could also have a class for success which contains the actual data so the actual items which is a list of person here so why don't we do it like that because that way we can also easily distinguish between the different states so if we're loading we simply show the progress bar if there's an error we show the error message and so on. The reason is with with this data class, if we use a data class instead of a C class as a parent element, these elements are not mutually exclusive. So what that means is if we have such a class, we can have two or even three of these active at the same time. So let's say we have a caching layer in our app and we can actually load the cache data from our database, but we don't have internet connection. So that means we do have a list of items that comes from the cache, but we also have a network error. So we want to show items and an error at the same time. And that doesn't work with this here class because it's, it's either or. We can either have a loading state, either an error state or a success state. And with this UI state class, we can have all of these theoretically at the same time, or just two of these or just one of these. So that's why I just used the single, um, error seal class here that defines the different types of errors 
and then we can pass these here. That's why I don't do it like this. So far so good, there is one more use case for seal classes that makes your code clean. And that is a much easier one, much easier to understand than what I taught you here before. And that is using it to make some parameters more readable. So you might have seen this person class in my repository. Each person just has a name and a variable if it's a male or not. And that's a boolean. So if that's true, it's a male. If it's false, it's a female. Of course, this works and we can distinguish between male and female with a boolean. But the problem is it's not really readable. So if a new person joins your project and sees this and sees, okay, is male as actually false? What does it mean? Does that now mean it's a female? Does it mean it's, it's any other kind of gender? We don't know. Maybe we only have male and female in our app and this would technically be fine, but a new person wouldn't know that. And nowadays it of course makes fully sense to, to think that there are multiple genders here in this app. So the way we could fix this is with a here class. So we could, for example, do this in here. We could also do this here class outside of this person class if we reuse it at different places. But let's do it in here. We can define a sealed class gender. We can just define different genders here. So object um, male, which is a gender, and object female, which is also gender. So even if we just have these two options in our app, we can now rename this to gender and assign a gender here. And this is of course much more readable if we then see something like a gender.male or gender.female. And if we then also decide to extend this in future, if we want to support multiple genders, I don't know, there are so many nowadays, then we can just do this in this gender class here and we can simply add more and then also automatically assign more to this gender variable. So in most cases, using a boolean is fine if you just have two options. For example, is visible, if that's false, then you know it's not visible because there are those clear two options. But let's say you'd also decide if, if an element should be displayed on the left or on the right, then you don't really want to use a boolean is left. Because is, if is left is false, you don't really know, okay, is it now at the top? Is it now at the bottom, the right? No, then you would create a seal class for that. So maybe alignment.left, alignment.right. And even if you only have these two options, it makes your code a lot more readable. So that is it for this video. Um, a little bit longer than I actually <laughs> expected, but it's a very important video to make your code cleaner. And I hope you liked it. If so, then you definitely will also like my free email newsletter. So you can check down below and subscribe to that for free. So you will get regular Android content, Kotlin advice, clean architecture advice right into your inbox. So you also see some text written content by me. Apart from that, I wish you an excellent day and I see you back in the next video. Bye bye.